or hey everybody, welcome. This is my lecture on Theodore Adorno. This is part of ideology critique. Um, these are some things that we will talk about. His examples of um, how he does ideology critique. We'll look at the marriage traits and gift giving. Um, we'll look at culture industry, dialectic of enlightenment, utopia as negative dialectics, and also his version of utopia, which is non-identity thinking and constellations. Um, yeah, so here is the outline, this is the order that we will be talking about them. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and get started. But basically, I guess just one quick idea about how Adorno goes about things is he's always looking at the way things are and he's looking and he's trying to think, well, what's wrong or what's missing? What's lost? What did we used to have, but we don't anymore? What could be better? So like, for example, we have hunger in the world. That's a problem. And so he would say, what's missing? People having enough food, um, you know, same with um, people who are injured. Um, what's missing? Enough, you know, affordable care or being able to go to the, the hospital, things like that. So he looks at what is kind of wrong with the world and thinks about, tries to imagine a better world. So that's kind of his ideology critique is thinking about what is missing, what's lost. And he calls that negative dialectics. But we'll talk about that. That's basically what we're going, the main idea of what we're going to be learning, as well as um, examples about how he does ideology and utopia. So one of the ideas that Adorno focused on was when people want to get married, they think of intelligent, intelligence or education as just an attribute, just like, oh, I want to marry someone smart. I want to marry someone educated. But what's missing from this way of thinking? Um, he says that people just think about intelligence and education like they're just stocks, like a um, cup of, right? It doesn't matter what the contents of the intelligence is. And that's how people think about intelligence when they want to get married. They think, wow, he's A plus. He made 100. He's a good student. So if I marry him, I'll have a high rate of return, right? Maybe because I married this smart person, I'll be rich. Or maybe my kids will be smart too. And so they will help me be rich. Or You know what I mean? So he doesn't like this idea that people want to marry someone just because they're smart, because they don't realize something that's important. They don't, they're missing something, right? What are they forgetting? They're for, they're, they forget that um, as soon as intelligence is more than just an uh, inert characteristic, inert just means like, it's not just like um, a stable thing that can't move. Um, as soon as it becomes active, as soon as intelligence becomes active, like what if this smart A plus student says, I want to study global warming. I want to move to Antarctica. As soon as the intelligence starts to move and is not just something that gives me money, people sometimes say, ah, no thanks. I'm not ready for that. So it's basically something that Adorno is looking at is people will misread intelligence. People will misunderstand intelligence and education and not realize um, what intelligence can become or what it, it can do. So this is how Adorno does ideology critique. He calls it negative dialectics. It's basically looking for the part where people don't see, looking at the blind spot. So when people drive in a car, there's usually a part that people can't see. And that's usually when accidents happen. So you can see this lady that from the last slide, right? She didn't realize that smart, right? That smart doesn't just mean that you can be rich. Smart could also mean you might go to Antarctica to study global warming or might do, see, think things that the other person wouldn't expect. Um, so that's what Adorno tries to do. What are people not seeing? Look for the blind spot. What did other people not notice? 
Also look for places that the concept of smart and the actual thing like being smart are different. So the way people think about smart and the way smart actually is, what it actually does are different. That's also a blind spot, seeing of how the concept and the actual thing are different. So this is basically how negative dialectics works. What does the concept of smart not include? So the way people think about smart and the way smart actually is, how are they different? So what is lost? What is forgotten? What do we not see usually, right? So that's negative dialectics. So let's keep going. Let's look at another example. So um, continuing on this wedding theme or marriage theme, often at weddings, people have a gift registry. Wedding registry must haves. So these are, these are things that the marrying couple will ask their friends to give them. So they'll make a list and say, um, I want this cool vacuum cleaner, right? I want this espresso machine. I want this luggage. So um, Adorno would look at this wedding registry, this list of requests and say, what's missing? What, what did we lose when we have this registry? Um, I don't think that they do this in Japan, making a, um, a list of gifts that they request, but this is very popular in America. They say, I want this, I want this, I want this. And then different friends would get each one. But what is lost in this wedding gift giving um, custom? For Adorno, he says the human impulse is lost. So before they did um, wedding registries, people could just think, well, I wonder what my friend would like. Maybe he would like this painting. Maybe he would like this movie. Maybe he or she would like this um, a drink machine, right? So the gift could come from their friend's heart and it could be um, associated with their love and their connection and their desire for the um, marrying couple. So the human impulse is lost with the wedding registry. It reduces things and people to mere function. So instead of getting something unexpected, and instead of letting your friend choose, it's basically telling all of your friends, hey friend, don't choose a gift for me. Let me choose the gift. Of course, Adorno does recognize that a gift registry is better than having 100 toasters or everybody choosing the same gift, but it's just the idea that we lost something when we do wedding registries. We lost the human impulse and the gift that creates a conversation and that helps us see our friends and the way that they think. So another thing that um, Adorno critiques is the administration of gifts as charity. So of course we appreciate um, these things like the Department of Family and Child Services that um, people get food stamps, people who don't earn enough money, the government will give them like a coupon to buy um, food. So that is something that the government does to support poor people, people who don't have enough money. But something has been lost, right, in this um, administration of gifts, in this utilitarian form of gift giving. A utilitarian form is like, oh, okay, so the government is trying to be practical. But when the government tries to be practical by giving coupons to poor people for food, something has also been lost. Again, it's the human impulse, right? Instead of me saying, oh, my friend just lost his job. I need to help him. We say, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. The government will give them coupons. So the human impulse has been lost. And when the human limp, when the human impulse has been lost, um, the government just gives you, okay, here's a coupon, here's a coupon, here's a coupon. People start to feel 
ashamed. They feel like, oh yeah, I, I'm poor. I had to get a coupon. People might feel like, oh yeah, I don't, I, my, I don't work enough. I don't make enough money. They feel like they're not good enough. So that's why people say like on the dole, usually on the dole, they line up to get money or food and they feel kind of embarrassed. They feel like they, they don't have the dignity. So that's why people sometimes say, I want work, not dole. I want a job. I don't want free coupons. And so instead of there being a human impulse where I give money to my neighbor and we have a better relationship and we support each other, the government has, has um, taken on this role and said, okay, I'm going to give everybody coupons. And so that human spirit has been lost. The human impulse to help each other has been, you know, it's become a utilitarian thing. And so basically what Adorno noticed in this form of gift giving is the human impulse again has been lost. So we've lost an aspect of our um, human nature, of our human capacity to give and show love to our friends and our neighbors and people in our community because we have said, okay, let's create a system. Um, it's we show um, kindness and love a lot or like we don't, we feel like, oh, okay, the system will take care instead of um, doing it normally. So those are just examples of negative dialectics, right? Looking at this blind spot, what was lost? That is the theme of Adorno, negative dialectics, looking at what was lost. So now we're going to look at Adorno's culture industry. This is an idea about how um, you know, people will uh, work, 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 and then they think, oh, yay, I worked hard, so therefore I'm, I have some free time. And what am I going to do with my free time? I'm going to watch TV. And because I watch TV, that will give me energy to go back to work. But Adorno sees this as a culture industry, as kind of a negative cycle. He thinks that something has been lost because we work relax, work, relax, work, relax. Something has been lost. Something, something that has been lost for Adorno is our, um, what we really want in life. I don't, maybe most people in life don't just want to go to work and then be really, really tired. And the only thing they can do on their holiday is watch TV. No, maybe some people, hopefully most people would have goals in their lives. Maybe they would want to create something. Maybe they would want to be creative, maybe write a book, maybe learn a language, maybe go somewhere they've never been before. Hopefully they could have the energy and the power to do something in life, to achieve something in life that is their dream that they would want to do, not just only have enough energy to watch TV. That's what culture industry is about. It's the work is so hard that there is a high demand to just, um, watch something that doesn't challenge us to grow. And that's how Adorno sees most of Hollywood. So um, before capitalism, before like modern society, before the industrial revolution, this is what society was like. There would be maybe one person who digs a well. And because one person dug a well, maybe a few people dug a well, but because they dig a well, their whole team, their community, their tribe, their group of friends can get water and they can survive. And so the person who dug a well, he feels connection to the work that he did. He feels like it's meaningful, right? He feels like, hey, I dug the well. I helped people. Yes. He feels a connection to his work, which is digging. And he, that helps him feel connection, meaning with the people around him. His work was meaningful because he helped his friends, right? The people around you will have drinking water. You are creating the world that you're living in, right? You're building something, it's meaningful. Your hard work pays off. People recognize and celebrate what you did. This was pre-modern society before capitalism. People would do something that would help everybody and they feel like, oh, I did something important. Same with the cap, same with the clockmaker before capitalism in pre-modern society. 
He sees his clocks around town and he feels satisfied. He says, wow, look at that clock I made. I did it. I helped, I helped the community. I helped the people in my town to be on time. I helped make this town work. He feels like his work is meaningful because he's contributing to the life of society by building clocks. So now we're going to talk about in the industrial society, in the, in the capitalist society, living in a consumerist society like we all do. So this is what it would be like to build a clock in a consumerist society. You would take 100 people, so here's many people, right? Put them on an assembly line. So this is an assembly line. It's a, like a, a way of working and building stuff. So part of the clock would come by and this person like Charlie Chaplin, who we've seen before, he would just screw one thing on. His job is just to go boop, like this all day. Boop. So one clock comes by, boop. one clock comes by, boop. one clock comes by, boop. and the next person has a different job. The next person job, this person has a hammer. And what does he do? Bone, bone, bone. So he just, he just hits the, the clock, different clocks every day. And of course, this is actually very productive, right? With these people, with a, with a set of team, with one person just going boop, 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 the next person go bump, bump, bump. They can actually make a lot of clocks because they have a team and one person just does one thing, the other person does another thing. Right, put this piece of metal into this groove. Boop, boop, boop. Send it down the line. Shoo, shoo. These people can make 10,000 clocks in a day. So that means society can have a lot more clocks, right? But there are some bad parts of bad things about this way of, of um, doing work, right? Only one small piece of the clock. That's all you see. You only see that piece that you put in. You don't see the final product. So he just sees this small piece of the clock. He doesn't see the product that he's making. So he feels disconnected from his work. He feels disconnected to his contribution to the world. He doesn't feel like, oh, right? He doesn't feel like this guy who made the whole clock and he gave it as a gift. All he sees is just this little piece that he did. And he sees that every day. And he does it a thousand times. He's like, I'm tired of doing this all day. Same with a grocery store clerk, right? Have you ever worked at a job like this at a register? Grocery store workers may not feel proud of their work either. They may not feel connection to the people who they are feeding. Of course, it is an important job, but they didn't make the food, right? Like one of my students was complaining about their job at a 7-Eleven. She said that she feels like a robot. She just says, bing, you know, click, 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 click. Always just um, scanning the items, scanning the items, scanning the items. She said she feels like a robot. She says people don't say thank you, but she just always says the same thing. Thank you very much, have a nice day. Bing, bing, bing. Thank you very much, have a nice day. Do you want a bag? Thank you very much, have a nice day. So she feels like, oh, I don't feel like it's meaningful. I just do the same thing over and over. She just feels like it's just scanning. She doesn't feel like she's doing the important job. She doesn't feel like she's feeding people, which may be the farmer in the pre-capitalist um, society would feel, he would feel meaning whenever he made the food for the society. But of course, there are a lot of benefits to um, the consumerist society, the capitalist society. Look at all these great things that we can have. We have more products. It's easier now to buy a clock it's easier now to buy books, right? So in the pre, before capitalism, only a few people could read. Only a few people had books and everybody else couldn't read, they couldn't be educated. And I'm really thankful we have books because we can learn important things that will help us. We can, um, you know, everybody can have a clock, everybody can have these potato chips because um, of this like capitalist way of doing work. So. You know, there's good things and there's bad things about it, right? So these products, because we're in this capitalist society, we can make a lot of things and things are cheaper. Everybody can buy books. Everybody can buy clocks. So these are the benefits, right? I'm not just saying that um, the new society, new capitalist society is bad. There's obviously good things about it. 
Um, but right, so all that Adorno is wanting to, us to remember is what has been missing, what is lost, right? So we have this new consumerist society. We all have houses, and of course, those houses are great, and we appreciate them. But right, because we all live in houses, we live in apartments, oftentimes we don't know our neighbors, right? We just live in our little home. We're separated. We don't need the people around us. We all have everything that we need. And, you know, we don't, we're not dependent on each other. We don't help each other like society did before capitalism. So um, consumerist society, we have, we have our own houses. We also, whenever we go into our houses, we have TVs. So TV is another box like our house. It delivers you shows, movies, entertainments. But actually this actually alienates us. It separates us. It disconnects us from our purpose and ourselves. Well, how so? How does the TV do that? This is what um, Adorno is talking about with the culture industry. He says that um, leisure time, he studied the leisure time of the consumerist society. He studied America in like the 1940s. And he looked at how did they spend their time when they're off? And maybe you guys know this um, picture of Homer Simpson. Uh, I just love these lazy Saturdays, right? So he worked hard Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Maybe he didn't work hard if we know Homer, but um, he's very happy. He, he, um, after he worked, he's able just to sit on his couch and relax and watch TV, drink a beer. And so what Adorno did is he looked at people like Homer Simpson, the average American, and he saw, what are they doing with their free time? And he realized when the workers aren't working, they are relaxing. So he thought that many um, Americans, they see work as a sacrifice. They see it as not fun, it's not meaningful, but it's necessary, right? And they receive their relaxation, their um, Saturday and Sunday as a reward for their work. I worked hard, so I deserve to relax. I deserve to watch TV. That's my reward. And so he realized that's how many people think about their free time. But what they realized, it's this, really, it's this what is happening. Work, we get, we, have, we start with energy on Monday maybe, but then work is hard, work is hard, work is hard, and then we're out of energy. And so whenever we come home, we have no energy and we're very tired and we need to watch TV or just do something that doesn't require energy. And that will help us have just enough energy to go back to work. So by doing something that is very relaxing, like TV or just something that doesn't make us think will help us feel better to go back to work. Right, so um, the relaxing, we just we feel just good enough so that you can work again. So what Adorno realized and pointed out was this relaxation time is actually just an extension of work, right? If we didn't have this relaxation time, we couldn't back, go back to work. So leisure time has actually become a part of our work, right? The leisure time isn't used for our goals, for our personal goals. It's just used to help us feel just good enough to go back to work. The leisure time isn't used to build ourselves, to help ourselves grow. We feel tired because of work. We relax so that we can keep working. Right? We feel tired because of work. Most people want to just watch the relaxing shows, the entertaining shows with simple messages, right? He, Adorno looked at the, the media that people consume and what people wanted to watch. And this relaxing, entertaining shows with simple messages, they often just have predictable one patan messages like bad guys always lose. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So just, you know, don't, don't um, change too much. You know, if something bad happens, just, you know, try to be satisfied and make the best out of it. That's what if life gives you lemons, make lemonade means. 
right? So most people want to watch sci-fi or superhero movies to take us out of this world so that we don't need to think about our problems of every day. We don't need to think about work. We can just see, watch the superhero movie. We can watch the sci-fi movie. And that can help us you know, not focus on our problems or our work too much. We can just go, go out, think about something else. We can just relax in another world. That's what Adorno realized is leisure time is in the consumerist society in America in the 1940s. So entertainment that makes us relax. This is a high demand. A lot of people want this. They just want to relax. So that's why Hollywood, Netflix creates such films and TV programs. They don't make us think they're not too complicated. They just are like, ah, relax. So um, we feel tired because of work and the leisure time. And another thing that Adorno noticed is many times they will be the same program, but just slightly different, just a little bit different. And that helps us feel like we got something new. It's kind of like, ah, that program last time wasn't enough. But maybe if it's a little bit different, I'll feel like I got something new and then I'll feel happy and then I can go back to work again. So, um, right, what the first product couldn't give me, maybe the next product can. And so that's why I put these pictures of these different kind of boy bands and girl bands. It's because they're just a little bit different and that makes us feel like we got something new. And because we got something new, I feel a little bit better. And so I can go back to work. That's what Adorno noticed. But think about it. Will the next boy band or girl band or superhero movie, will they really help me face the problems of my life? Will they really help me overcome the issues that are, you know, the problems that I have maybe at work? Maybe if I have a, a problem with a coworker, will these boy bands, will they really help me solve the problem? Actually, Adorno thinks that these kinds of media actually makes us avoid the problem. So the problem could get worse because we don't try to solve it. Maybe because we just, you know, um, become obsessed with these artists. We won't think about the problems of our lives and how to make ourselves better and fix the problems. But so what, what Adorno says, what is lost in this kind of culture industry where we just, have, we just um, watch the media that makes us relax? What has been lost? What Adorno says has been lost is that leisure time could actually be, sent, be spent solving problems, right? We could actually solve our work problems. Maybe if we have a problem with our coworker, maybe we could do our work better. Maybe we could do something more um, meaningful with our time. So when Adorno says we could spend time solving problems, maybe we could build our own business. We don't have to work for somebody else. Maybe we could do our own business, something exciting for us, and we could make meaning in our world. We could be like the, the clockmaker before capitalism. We could be, see like, wow, I did this. Maybe we could make an invention. Maybe we could make rockets. Maybe we could make a new light bulb. Maybe we could make something like that. Maybe we could write a book in our leisure time. Maybe we could spend meaningful time with friends and family and have a deeper relationship with the people that we love. That's how we could spend our leisure time. We could spend our leisure time progressing knowledge, learning more, um, you know, that could, that could help our lives become more meaningful. Maybe we could just spend our time cooking for our friends, cooking for our family. Maybe we could spend our time exercising, making ourselves healthier, doing sports and activities that we enjoy. That's how we could do our leisure time. We could be getting stronger. We could spend our leisure time learning a language, right? We could, we could learn a language and talk to new people and expand our world instead of just watching relaxing and inter relaxing entertainment that don't help us grow, don't help us solve our problems. So these are ways, this is actually what's been lost with the culture industry, right? These, these meaningful things that we could be doing, we're not doing them because the work is too hard. We see it as not meaningful. We see it as a sacrifice for which we need to be rewarded. So the demand of the majority who want to relax and go back to work, 
this is what the consumer art arose out of, the superhero movies, the sci-fi movies. Hollywood creates consumer art to make money by giving the majority what they want, right? Because most people just want to watch, you know, sci like superhero movies so they don't think about their problems. Um, that's, what, that's why Hollywood makes those kinds of movies, because people want them. Because people want them, if they make them, they can make money. So Adorno talks about what true art is. Like true art is actually not easy to consume, right? We need to concentrate to appreciate its depth. And I would like to share a, a video of someone who, like a famous scientist who actually very much loves this painting and he explains it in a very nice way. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson and he is explaining about this painting by Van Gogh, Starry Night. And I will show that to you now. <laughs> Starry Night, I, what, you know what I like about Starry Night? It's not what Van Gogh saw that night, it's what he felt. How do you know night. what he felt? Because this is not an, a representation of reality. Oh, okay. And anything that deviates from reality is reality that has filtered through your senses. And I think art at its highest is exactly that. If this was an exact depiction of reality, it would be a photograph and I don't need the artist. Mm, okay. So even photographs that take you to a slightly other kind of dimension as you gaze upon them, it's more than what was actually going on at the time. And that's... That's art taken to the craft of photography. That's why you like it? That's, that's one of the reasons why. Plus, I think it was the very first painting where its title is the background. Think about that. This could have been called, uh, you know, in the full painting, obviously, this is a, a, a snippet. A town. Yeah, yeah. So there's a town there. There's a cypress tree. There's a church steeple. It could have been called Cypress Tree. It could have been called Sleepy Village. It could have been called Rolling Hills. But no, it's called Starry Night. And everything in mm. front of it, everything in front of it is just in the way. And how often do you paint something where the title is the background? That, that's my point. And in this particular case, the background is the universe. And so, so for me, this was a pivot point in art. And it's uh, 1889, which is recent given the history of uh, paintings and you know that go all the way back. <laughs> What's interesting about the original one is that the town is realistically depicted. The trees are recognizable as trees. If you ever saw a sky that looked like that, the end would be here. Yeah, exactly. Those Plus, that times. swirling is yeah. not what wind is and it's not clouds because if it was if it was clouds, you wouldn't see the stars. Right. The what is it? Uh, it's how he felt. That's all I can tell mm. you. By the way, that is a real evening. So that's sorry. It's not even the. It's early morning. The crescent moon, when it's that orientation, means this is before sunrise. And that white object lower on the horizon, that's sort of glowy. That's very likely Venus, and that enables us to trace what's over what set of weeks this painting was actually uh, painted. Mm. So it's it's kind of like uh, forensic astronomy. <laughs> Has if anyone you will. done an analysis of like where he must have been? Yeah, yeah, that's well known. Yeah, he, yeah. Was, he was in a real place. And so that He really didn't pull this be... out of his ass, right? I mean, it was, right. he, he painted what he saw, folded into what he felt. Ooh, yeah. Heavy. That's how art should be, I think. Yeah? Otherwise, what, what do you need artists for? Uh, make cool shit? The cool stuff is something that they felt and it came out of them. Yeah. And yeah. they feel stuff, they, artists feel, feel the, the natural world in ways different from the rest of us. And that's why they're artists. Do they, or do they just express it with? Oh, sorry. More, yes, they not only. Skill. Yes, we all can feel it, but to be able to express it, that that's a whole other talent. Right. Just to catch. And you know what I think about often? Um, why do you, why do we all know who Paul Revere is? All right. We all we we. It's a household name. Yet, is there any other war ever fought in the history of the world where a household name is the name of the person who told other people the enemy was coming? We, we can mention his name, but we can't list the generals that all fought in that war. Why? It's because a poem was written about him. And he had this mundane job, let me tell people the enemy is coming. And so the artist, in this case the poet, elevated the mundane to something that forces you to, to reckon it with 
your understanding of this world. What's Joyce, uh, uh, Joyce Kilmer's most famous poem? It's about a tree. Dogs piss on trees. You drive by trees, you don't even know they're there. Yet a poem about a tree. I'll never see something as lovely as a tree. Oh my gosh. This, so the art forces you to pause and just reflect on things that you took for granted, things that became ordinary in your life, and they were elevated. Thank you for watching that. So the role of art, according to Adorno, is to represent the possibility of a different world, right? Art actually is a way of doing negative dialectics. It's a way of seeing the world in a new way. Art, true art, should help us see what is lost, see what is missing, and see things in a new way and break, break us break us free from ideology, right? The role of art is to represent the possibility of the free deployment of forces of production. So that basically means art could represent a world in which I want to work, in which I want to be creative, and I don't just feel like, uh, oh, I just take this job because I want to make money. They could just think, wow, I want to make something meaningful for my community. I want to do something meaningful for my family. I want to work. I want to produce something. And we don't just see it as a sacrifice for which we need to be rewarded with, like, you know, junk television. Um, right? A world in which people find purpose and meaning in their work. So art could open that world to us. It could reveal that um, possibility way of seeing the, the world. So true art considers what does not exist. It considers perspectives that are not considered. It is not distorted by exchange. So exchange just means like, oh, if I give you uh, money, you'll give me something, right? Art is about vision. It's about seeing in a new way. It's not about money. I mean, of course, you know, people make money from art. But, you know, art and the spirit of art that like what Art Adorno is talking about is not about money. It's about um, just seeing the world in a new way, discovering, you know, having new ideas, thinking in a new way. Right. True art is free from domination. It serves no purpose. Right. It doesn't serve the Hollywood. It doesn't serve people demand for like relaxation. It doesn't serve people gratification. It's actually antagonistic to consumer society, right? It's not just feeding people's hunger for, you know, easy to consume, like relaxation. It's, it's really not serving that system. It's outside of that system. So another thing that Adorno says is true art weakens the subject's dominance over its object, right? In art, subject and object can speak together. So um, in art, right, um, we don't really know exactly what we're making, right? The art kind of will speak back to the author. This is something that um, we will talk about in this class is like the artist doesn't completely know, doesn't really completely understand the art because the art will always speak back. And um, yeah, so like we learned in structuralism, we don't, really, we don't really need to ask what the artist meant for art, right? Because the art itself creates meaning. The art itself speaks. So we actually don't need the author for a meaning to tell us what it means. The art itself is full of meaning. And so the art itself speaks. And we don't need to ask. Um, so uh, Van Gogh, what did you mean whenever you whenever you did this? So yeah, so like Neil deGrasse Tyson, I don't think that the sort sure some things he learned about from Van Gogh, but the art itself has deep meaning, and so um, yeah, so the true art only in art can the subject master its material without doing violence to it, which is always violence to the self. So it's basically the art 
the, the um, subject, like the artist is making something, but through making something, the art becomes alive and the art reveals itself and the, the beauty is revealed in the world. But the artist is not the master of the art. The art has a life of its own. And that's what true art is, the art that speaks into the world. And this, the artist is not the master of the art. The art itself is alive and speaks and reveals to us things, uh, you know, uh, the possibility of a world that is freer. So this is another example of Adorno's um, negative dialectics. He, he looked at the idea of enlightenment, which we are going to talk about now. And he tried to see like the, the negative dialectics of enlightenment. I guess you could say an ideology critique of enlightenment. So what is enlightenment? It's the 18th century movement of, of which reason and logic um, the senses are the primary sources of knowledge. In enlightenment, it's usually elevates science above religion. So it's kind of like to say, oh, you know, religion is part of the past. We have science. We have reason now. We don't need to think. We don't need to rely on the king to tell us what to do. We don't need to rely on religion to tell us what to do. So in enlightenment, government becomes less centered around a king and the government is guided by citizens' reason and the will of the majority, what most people want. And the government protects the individual right. So yeah, that sounds like a good thing, you know? Um, but, you know, Adorno asked, well, what is missing in enlightenment? What did, what did they not see? So we're going to look at two enlightenment thinkers and how Adorno interacted with them. So one is Adam Smith. This is Adam Smith. He's the father of economics. And he is someone who supported this idea, the um, division of labor, where by doing work this way at a factory, we can all be richer, right? Because Adam Smith wants societies become richer. Because if we have more products, we will, be, we will have more things. Um, life will be easier, right? And like using using this logic um, of work where we can have more things. So Adam Smith wants more of this, the division of labor, not this. The old way, only a few people can have a clock. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could have a clock? And so that's why he wanted to do things this way. Right? Because if we do things this way, for Adam, according to Adam Smith, we can make more, we can have faster, cheaper, more efficient work, more people can own a clock, more people can have jobs. So there's a lot of benefits to doing work this way. If we do things the old way with a craftsperson, this will take too long, clocks will be more expensive. Only a few rich people can own clocks. Fewer people will have jobs. So let's think about the Adorno, the, what was missing in Adam Smith's way of thinking. Right, so this is how, uh, right, so Adorno liked, or sorry, not Adorno, Adam Smith liked this, he did not like that. That's just all I wanted to say. Right, but Adorno realized that something is missing, right? What was missing? This is Adorno's critique of Adam Smith, right? Adorno says, no, 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 this division of labor is missing something. If we do this new way, we're disconnected from our work. Work is painful. We need compensation, right? We feel like this was a sacrifice, so we need compensation by watching the Hollywood movies. We think less, we become more stupid, become uh, more monotony, more boring, less freedom whenever we do work this way. And he realized, well, what was missing? What, what did we lose from this time? Well, actually during this time, um, you know, the work feels more meaningful, we feel more connection to the work, recognition, more autonomy, more freedom, we need to think more. And of course, you know, um, this is just doing negative dialectics, but of course, even something was missing during this time. Like for example, um, one thing that Adorno says is that, like, what do you want Adorno? He said, well, I would like a world where everybody could have food and there's no more hunger. That's one of the quotes by Adorno. 
So I think that he does appreciate that we have these clocks and we have these things, but he's just noticing what's missing, which is the connection to the work um, and the, the, the harshness of the new style of work. So that's negative dialectics. He's looking at this way of work and noticing the bad things, what was lost from this. The progression actually was also a regression. The moving forward also at the same time losing something. So here is the next enlightenment thinker that um, Adorno would, was interacting with, Immanuel Kant. Um, so Immanuel Kant, he tried to think, well, how can I use logic to determine my behavior or determine the best behavior? So that way I don't need religion. I don't need the king. I can use logic, reason, to decide what is best for humanity to do, to act, to behave. So he says, what must I do? Kant's answer, if everyone lied, the world would be in chaos. No progress would be made. So he basically said, if everybody does the same thing, um, and, it, and if everybody does that thing, and it just creates chaos, then nobody should do that thing. Because it's, we all have a duty to not create chaos. We have a duty to make the world a peaceful and a better place. So therefore, he created this idea of categorical, which means always, and imperative, which means must. So he made an idea. There are some things that we have a duty that we always must do. And one of those things is telling the truth. We have a duty not to lie. Because if people lie, it creates chaos in the world. People can't understand each other. People can't work. So basically through reason, using this logic, um, he realized or he, he proposed that we have a duty that we must do, a categorical imperative, a must, always must. Uh, it's a law that applies to everyone. Everyone must tell the truth, and everybody has the duty to tell the truth. Um, it is not a means to something else, right? This behavior of telling the truth um, is something that we all must do. It's not something that will make something better. We just need to tell the truth, even if, like, you know, we have the duty to tell the truth, even if um, it could result in something bad. That is Immanuel Kant's idea. But Adorno thinks that this is missing something, right? He thinks that Immanuel Kant uh, forgot something, right? He thinks that this morality through reason is missing something. Using logic to arrive at a rule that requires you to always act the same way every time without thinking, that's not good. Like we don't have to think anymore. So he thinks that arriving at behavior through reason actually removes the human impulse, right? It removes sympathy, it removes compassion, it removes pity, right? These are impulses that are natural imp instincts, right? So sometimes maybe we feel some, we see somebody who needs help and we say, I'm gonna help them. So I do that because we feel, we feel like a human sorrow, we feel like a human, something that we want to do to help them. But for Kant, so the way Adorno reads Kant is that like, oh, I don't have that, that, that sense is not that important. The only thing that is important is my reason, my, my logical thinking of like, okay, I always have to tell the truth, I always have to do this. And that removes my human impulse to help people. Right, the impulse is denied for the sake of the rational self, right? The thinking person who says, oh, I should never lie because if I lied, the world would be in chaos and I would be contributing to chaos, so I need to do my duty. That's denying our human impulse to help people. So Kant's, uh, Kant attempts to establish freedom on the rational basis, but that freedom actually becomes unfreedom, right? He's trying to be free from religion, free from the king, free from the state, by using reason, oh, I'm so smart, I'm free. But that freedom actually becomes unfreedom because he ignores the human spirit. And that's the thing, that's the um, negative dialectic that Adorno realized. The thing that was missing was again, the human impulse. So what is enlightenment? 
Um, it suggests progress in self-consciousness and observable throughout human history. That's the idea that people normally think about enlightenment. But Adorno thought that something was, min was missing. He realized this way of enlightenment is actually just kind of dominating, right? It's like dominating my humanity. It's not letting me show compassion. It's not letting me find meaning in my work. It's actually dominating me and oppressing me and hurting me. So what Adorno wanted to do was rethink enlightenment in a way that is not dominating, that's not hurting me, that's not oppressing me. He wants it to be liberated. He wants it to be freed from this way of dominating. So he thinks that this way of enlightenment thinking is actually dehumanizing. He thinks that it's, so he thinks that this way of enlightenment thinking like, oh, using logic will um, help me be free is actually dehumanizing. So, right, um, it's kind of like this emperor wears the emperor's new clothes, right? These people, tell this king, they say, hey, this is a new fancy way of doing things. Look at this new fancy clothes. This is by really special way of doing things. But actually, by doing it the way that these people said, instead of getting something good, he actually lost something, right? That's the emperor's new clothes. So it's the same way that enlightenment is, right? Light, enlightenment makes people think that they've got something new, They've got freedom from the government or freedom from the church or freedom from religion by using reason. But actually, what, what actually happened was they lost something. So the logical self becomes the source of reason and becomes the authority of action. And by making the, the brain the source, the human self is denied. They deny their human desire, their human impulse. And by doing this enlightenment thinking, the blood and the bo body have become rejected as mythical. They're just like, oh, that's just superstition. That's like machine, right? And the instinct is superstition, thoughtlessness, and just lust. They just think, oh, it's just like an animal, just instinct and just the blood and body, just the, that's just a myth. You know, you don't need to think about what your body wants. You don't need to think about being hungry. All you need is just to think logically and everything will be good and then you'll be free. But that logical freedom is actually unfreedom, like Adorno said. Self-preservation, such as the division of labor, right? It forces people to mold themselves, body and soul onto the machine, right? So it's, so this, self-preservation idea that like is based in logic anything relate unrelated to self-preservation like preserving myself becomes a myth and it's unscientific it's illogical so self-preservation comes down to a choice it's either either survive or death that's the self-preservation the the logic well this way i i'll die soon this way i will live longer so i need to choose this way but this echoes the logical idea of two contradictory propositions, only one can be true and one false. It kind of, you know, maybe sometimes we want to do something that is a little bit fun or dangerous and that could be the human impulse, right? Um, but if we just are confined to this logic, we will always maybe just do boring or just ignore our our human desire, our human impulse. So enlightenment reduces itself to logic, right? Imposing binary caveman thinking, yes, no, kill or run, right? So if we only listen to logic, like this is, this is, will make me um, die soon. Maybe eating this hamburger that looks delicious will make me die soon. So therefore I'm gonna eat this broccoli, you know, um, that kind of yes, no, run, kill, it's this kind of binary thinking is actually very simplistic. It's not really complicated. It's not really interesting. So I wouldn't say it's not interesting, but um, it's just basically saying that enlightenment 
it's trying to say like, oh, I'm logical, oh, I'm smart. But oftentimes it just leads to binary thinking, which is just like a caveman. It's, it's you know, lower than a normal human being, which can see the colors and the beauty and the interact in the world with a, in a different way than a caveman, not just yes and no, kill and run. But, you know, a normal human should be able to see things in a more complex way. And enlightenment is actually not just a more smarter person. It's actually kind of more like a caveman. So I'm going to show a video about um, Odysseus, like because um, the Odysseus's sirens. Adorno felt that the story of Odysseus, which is like a classic Greek um, drama, classic Greek literature, um, he thought that this is kind of like what it is like today. It's kind of like an analogy or hue, right? And so we're going to watch that now. After leaving the Isle of Circe, Ulysses, the master of travels and deception, knew that he would have to face many dangers. The first would be to pass close by the island inhabited by the sirens. Half woman, half fish, these beautiful creatures enchanted sailors with their sweet song, luring their ships onto the rocky shore and devouring the castaways. Although Ulysses did not want to meet this gruesome fate, he yearned to hear the enchanting song that no one had ever heard and lived to tell about. Listen well, my friends. Many have perished, enchanted by the siren's sweet song. I'm going to close up your ears with wax so you will not be able to hear their alluring voices. Tie me firmly to the mast so that I won't be able to free myself. <laughs> Whatever I say, no matter what I may threaten or how much I may suffer, do not untie me. Bind me tighter. <laughs> Push the wax deeper into your ears and row as fast as you can. Eurylochus, go ahead, tie me up. I said, so taut that I can't move.
Blimey, you fools! Don't you hear that song? Turn the ship towards shore! Please let me go! Listen to me, my friends. Ignore the foolish orders I gave you before. I must have been out of my mind. I didn't know what I was saying. Take the wax out of your ears and untie me! Can't you see how this music fills me with ecstasy? Don't you want to feel this same joy? Huh? Fools, what are you doing? Don't you understand me? Just read my lips! In the name of all the gods and everything that's sacred, set me free! I must get on that island, whatever it takes! I'll swim there alone if you won't come with me! You won't stand in the way of my happiness! Yay.